In today's forensics lesson, we're going to focus on the judicial side of crime scene investigation and take a deep dive into where evidence goes once it leaves the crime scene. So the title of today's lesson is From the Crime Scene to the Courtroom. Now, the journey of evidence from the crime scene to the courtroom is a meticulous process that's vital for the pursuit of justice. Once collected, evidence undergoes analysis by forensics experts who employ various techniques to extract valuable information. And this can involve DNA testing, ballistic analysis, blood spatter analysis, forensic accounting. It just depends on the nature of the case. So all types of um, evaluation can happen uh, once evidence leaves the courtroom. Now, the findings of these analyses are documented and detailed in reports that provide crucial insights into the circumstances surrounding the crime. And if you ask any forensic investigator, they will say that the majority of the time uh, that's spent on the job is spent constructing these reports, usually for court. Now, once sufficient evidence is collected, a person might be charged with a crime. All right, so we're going to go back and do a little bit of history here. So this is going to feel like a history class for a little bit. Um, but if you'll remember from U.S. history, the U.S. Constitution was signed in 1787, and the Constitution set up the executive, legislative, and judicial branches of the United States government. And just two years after the Constitution was signed, Congress added 10 amendments to the Constitution, which we call the Bill of Rights. Now, you might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with forensics. Well, uh, there are 10 articles that make up the Bill of Rights, and Article 6 is the one that we're going to focus on. So Article 6, or the Sixth Amendment, gives citizens the right to a fair and speedy trial by an impartial jury. Um, and there's a lot of like judicial terminology. So this is like this simplistic watered down version. So this includes, the Sixth Amendment includes the right to a fast and public trial by an impartial jury. Uh, it includes the right to be aware of criminal charges brought against the defendant, uh, the right to confront witnesses during a trial, the right to have witnesses appear in the trial, and then, of course, the right to legal representation. Now, a jury is going to listen to arguments by both the defense and the prosecution. And a jury hears information about the physical and circumstantial evidence. They also can hear testimony from witnesses. And the jury is going to use the information presented in the trial to make an informed decision about the guilt or the innocence of the person on trial. Now, the jury is instructed to assume that the defendant is innocent until proven guilty. So innocent until proven guilty. So it's the job of the prosecution to prove the guilt of the defendant. Now, if you are in class today, um, we are going to take just a second to research the Casey Anthony trial. Uh, so this is a case study that we're going to just kind of quickly go over. We're going to talk about what happened in this case, and then we're going to focus on the trial portion of this specifically because it ties into the lesson today. But if you're just watching... Um, if you're just watching the lesson for today, I'm going to keep moving on. So as forensic science has continued to evolve, the following processes have been on the receiving end of scrutiny. So the way evidence is processed, uh, because evidence changes multiple hands and sometimes travels across state lines, evidence processing has been questioned. Um, and so a lot of times it, people, jury members even ask, is th was this evidence processed properly? was the integrity of the evidence maintained as the evidence was processed. Also, the type of evidence that is admissible in court. Um, so it brings up the question, should all evidence be allowed into the courtroom? Are there certain standards that this evidence should meet? Uh, also, equipment used to analyze data. So is this equipment that's used in data analysis and evidence analysis su uh, supported by science? Or is it just like a contraption that somebody created in their basement? Um, also, who can testify as an expert witness? Uh, so we know expert witnesses can be allowed to testify 
Um, but what credentials are needed to be an expert in a particular field? So you have hair analysis experts, fiber analysis experts, fingerprint examiners, blood spatter um, analysis experts, and what makes these people experts? So all of these things have, have been under the magnifying glass uh, in the judicial system, and these are um, pretty important questions. All right, if you're in class today, or for those students that are in class today, um, we're going to do this close reading assignment where we dig into two very instrumental cases that have paved the way for uh, forensics and how it ties in with the courtroom. So we're going to look at a case called Fry versus the United States and another case called Daubert versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. We're going to learn what those cases were about and then the outcome of those cases and how they apply to forensics. Um, so in a nutshell, and you will need to pause the video and make sure that you get this information down. It can be um, the two standards can be compared very easily using a Venn diagram, which is why I've got it here in this lesson. But at some point, you'll need to write this down because this is important. So what's the difference between the Fry standard and the Daubert ruling? Well, besides the dates, uh, you can see that Fry standard originated in 1923 and the Daubert ruling um, was many years later, 1993. Um, but both of these cases have shaped the standards for admitting evidence into the courtroom. Now, the Fry standard mandates that scientific evidence must be based on principles and techniques that are generally accepted by the scientific community in order to be admissible in court. Uh, and for a long time, that kind of held true, but there were some cases that popped up over time uh, that really kind of called the Fry standard into question. And so there was a need to uh, not change it, but... Um, make amends to it. So then the Daubert ruling in 1993 um, was a case that really called into question the acceptance of using expert testimony in the courtroom. Um, and it the Fry standard really didn't cover that. And so the Daubert ruling just kind of expanded upon what the Fry standard had already set in place. So the Daubert ruling determined that trial judges should assess the reliability and the relevance of scientific evidence and expert testimony. Um, and so basically the trial judge gets to decide what is allowed in the courtroom. Um, and the Daubert ruling really provided more flexibility to the admissibility of scientific evidence. Now, both of these standards, um, both of these cases have shaped the standards for admitting evidence in court and have helped to enhance fairness and reliability of our legal proceedings. Uh, so if you took the time to research the Casey Anthony trial, uh, you know this, but if not, the Casey Anthony trial, um, in the trial, an expert in smells was called in. So this guy that you see on the screen, um, his expertise allowed him to definitively sit in court and say that the decomposing body uh, of Kaylee Anthony was at one point in the trunk of Kaylee Anthony's mother, who is Casey Anthony, in her car. And if you've never heard of this case, you're probably very confused. So you might want to pause the video and just do a deep dive into that case. Um, but in a nutshell, this guy was allowed in the courtroom. He called himself a, a, a scent expert, and he said that he smelled hundreds of dead bodies, decomposing bodies, and based on his expertise, when he smelled the inside trunk of Casey Anthony's car, it did in fact smell like a decomposing body, okay? And he was allowed to say that in the courtroom and the jury heard that. Now, under the Fry standard, there is insufficient scientific um, science to support this type of evidence, um, but it was still allowed in the courtroom. How is that possible? Well, because under the Daubert ruling, the judge gets to decide. So the judge assessed the situation. That judge in this case decided that the smell expert was reliable uh, and relevant. And so that judge allowed the smell expert into the courtroom to testify. And according to the Daubert ruling, um, that was completely okay. Now, you can imagine this did cause quite the controversy. All right, let's talk just a little bit to finish out the lesson. Let's 
talk just a little bit um, about, so we know evidence is collected from the crime scene and we know the investigators kind of formulate these documents and put together uh, information and um, then they want to prosecute someone. So what are the court proceedings? This is very complicated, so I'm going to try to give you like just the rundown and this graphic organizer is going to help you kind of visualize everything as we talk through it. So at this point, investigators have done their job, um, a suspect's been arrested, and evidence has been collected. So then there's going to be an arraignment. And this is an initial hearing where a formal reading of the criminal charge is going to be made. And the defendant is then informed of the criminal charges against them. And in the process of discovery, which is the next part on the graphic organizer, the prosecution and the defense are going to exchange information about the case. Now, both sides need this information to decide whether the case can be resolved by a plea agreement or if it has to be set down for trial. Um, at this point, if um, they continue, a pre preliminary hearing is uh, going to be made, and a preliminary hearing is like a, like a mini trial. And the purpose of this is so that a judge can determine if the prosecution has enough evidence to actually go to trial. And then the trial takes place, and the defense and prosecution presents their case, and then the jury deliberation begins. And if the defendant is convicted, then a judge will issue sentencing. Uh, however, if the jury delivers a not guilty verdict, the defendant is free from charges um, and free of all charges brought against him. Now, if the defendant is found guilty, there is an appeal process where the case can be reviewed. Um, so that's a possibility. Uh, and that is a very brief description of how court proceedings work. So I hope you enjoyed this lesson on crime scene to courtroom um, and I will see you in the next lesson.